Yeah, I, I'm just, <laughs> you guys have read this, you know what I'm going to say. Um, we're going to be talking about the marginal note found in Isaiah 14, 12 in the 1611. So let's get started. Lesson 219, the AV 1611, examining the marginal notes, other notes of interest, Lucifer, the introduction. In Lesson 218, we began looking at, a, at the final category of marginal notes that we will be investigating, which I titled, quote, other notes of interest. For this category, we will be looking at miscellaneous marginalia addressing topics related to the defense of the King James Bible that often come up in public discussions. In Lesson 218, I laid out the following categories for consideration. We looked at Septuagint references last week. We looked at animals and beasts, specifically unicorns, behemoth, and leviathan. And then we looked at the marginal note on Psalm 12.7. And then I said last time that we would be looking at the, uh, the note on Lucifer. So, having covered the first three points in Lesson 218, the focus of this lesson will be on the marginal note appended to Isaiah 14.12 in the 1611 dealing with Lucifer. Okay? Now, here is the note. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? you notice you have double vertical lines on Lucifer. You come over here to the margin, and it says, or day star in the margin. All right? Now, let me just say that I'm gonna, what I'm going to cover here, it has the potential to kind of get me in hot water with people. Okay? So, um, it is what it is, but there's a note here that I've never heard anybody talk about it, and when I saw it, I about fell out of my seat because of all the different stuff that has been said about this verse over the years, okay? And I never looked into 1611, and I didn't know the note was there until I was preparing to, uh, for these lessons. So the note is at Isaiah 1412 on the word Lucifer, and on the margin it says, or day star, all right? So the Hebrew word rendered Lucifer by the King James translators, Hillel, I, I, heard, I clicked on a pronunciation thing, and I believe I'm saying that right, the word appears only one time in the Hebrew text. So the word translated Lucifer only appears one time in the Hebrew text. So this is uh, an instance where there is no place to necessarily cross-reference that specific word because the word only is this one place in the Hebrew text. Okay, So let's look at the next point. The marginal note in the 1611 at Isaiah 14, 12 is highly inconvenient. For many King James advocates, since the publication of New Age, we need to say Bible version, Sylvia, for all of these, okay? I forgot it. So that's this book right here, the publication of New Age Bible versions, okay? By Gail Ripplinger in 1993, many King James defenders, including myself, have used Isaiah 14, 12 as a major plank in their argumentation against modern versions. Ripplinger's argument stems from the fact that modern versions replace Lucifer with Morning Star or some equivalent in Isaiah 14, 12. And then I have three examples. So look at the NIV. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Morning Star, Son of the Dawn? Look at the New American Standard 2020. How art thou fallen from heaven, you Star of the Morning, Son of the Dawn? Notice there's a footnote here that says the Hebrew word is Hillel, or Halel, I believe is better, i.e. shining one. And then you have the ESV where it says, how art thou fallen from heaven, O day star? Notice that this matches the margin of the 1611, okay? Son of the dawn, all right? So the modern versions do not contain the word Lucifer in these verses. They contain either morning star or day star in the main body of the text, okay? So let's look at my next point. <clears throat> Ripplinger argued that the removal of Lucifer from Isaiah 14, 12 in modern versions is a, quote, New Age conspiracy to replace the identity of Satan with Jesus Christ, since Jesus Christ is clearly called the morning star in Revelation 22, 16. So let's look at that. So first, we have the verse in the King James Bible, Revelation 22, 16. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify unto you of the things in the, of these things in the churches. I'm the root of offspring of David and the bright and morning what? Star. So who's talking at the beginning of that verse? Jesus. Jesus. Look at the NIV. 
I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I'm the root and offspring of David and the bright morning star. New American Standard 2020. I, Jesus, whoops, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you of these things uh, for the churches. I'm the root and descendant of David, the bright and morning star. And then finally, the ESV, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I'm the root and descendant of David, the bright morning star. Okay, so what Gail Ripplinger asserts in New Age Bible versions is that when the NIV, ESV, New American Standard, and other Bibles in Isaiah 14, 12, take out the word Lucifer and put in morning star or day star, they are engaging in a new age conspiracy to obscure the identity of Satan and switch his identity for the identity of Jesus Christ based upon the cross reference there in Revelation twenty two sixteen. Okay? Now, let me just be upfront and frank. I myself have said this many times. I have used this argument that I got from Gail Ripplinger many times in my defense of the King James Bible against modern versions, okay? So I just want to be upfront about that. These arguments from Ripplinger serve as the underpinning of her entire inaugural book, which would be New Age Bible versions, all right? So they're the theoretical underpinning of basically everything she says in the whole book, this, this identity shift between, uh, this alleged identity shift between Lucifer and Jesus, or Satan and Jesus. All right. So the arguments, these arguments from Ripplinger serve as the underpinning of her entire inaugural book. In the introduction to, should say, New Age Bible versions, she alludes to an exchange with a student at Kent State University as the impetus for her book. Quote, after a decade in this climate, she's referring there in the context to in a secular university, as a Christian and professor, um, piled, pl sorry, we need to check. Plied. What? Plied? Plied with question. A bombshell hit as a young man asked, Is the fall recorded in Isaiah 14 about Lucifer, as the King James Version in Hebrew text indicates, or Jesus, the morning star, as the NIV New American Standard Bible implied? Practiced perception pointed to the latter as a mislaid podium of, new, of the New Age sages surrounding me. This prompted a six-year research project into new Bible versions, Greek editions and manuscripts, culminating with over 3,000 hours of word-for-word -word collation of the entire New Testament. So understand what Rippling is saying. She got a question from a student. Was Isaiah 14, 12 about Satan, or was it about Jesus? And the question was coming from the New Age version. Or, I'm sorry, from the New Bible version because of the way it was reading in the NIV, New American Standard, and other places. Okay, So that is the underpinning for why she's writing the book. All right. Next point. In chapter 2, it should say of New Age Bible versions, Rippingler lays out her core argument that serves as the launching pad for her entire book. Quote, 20th century versions have removed the name of Lucifer, thereby eliminating the only reference to him in the entire Bible. The word Lucifer then falls into the realm of the poets and writers of mythology and ceases to be an identifiable character of biblical origin. The change in the new versions does not spring from the original Hebrew language, but from the theology of the New Age version editor, new version editors. So she's saying their theology is leading them to translate it this way, not because of what the Hebrew text says. Is everybody following that? The NIV's wording parallels exactly the view expressed by NIV committee member R. Lard Harris, Laird Harris, possibly. He asserts that Isaiah 14 is not about Lucifer and his descent to hell, but about the king of Babylon and his internment in the grave. The NIV's version of Harris's view is one link in a chain tied to New Age Luciferian H.P. Blavatsky, who, laid the new, who, like the new versions and new the, uh, theolo theologians, denies the fall of Lucifer. Blavatsky writes the script 
for the 20th century scribes saying, quote, Now there are many passages in the Bible that prove on their face extra, um, historically, esoterically. esoterically that this belief was not was at one time universal, excuse me. And the two most convincing are Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14. Christian theologians are welcome to interpret the great war before creation. Now notice the ellipsis. If they so choose, but the obscurity of the idea is too apparent. Okay, now, <laughs> I have to check that quote from Blavatsky because Ripplinger is known for manufacturing quotes. I'm just, I'm sorry to say it that way, but there are many manufactured quotes in New Age Bible versions that I document in other lessons, okay? But understand what she's saying. She's saying this Luciferian Blavatsky is setting the stage for the theology of the editors of the new versions when they take away Lucifer out of the text and replace the identity, Satan's identi uh, identity as Lucifer with that of Jesus Christ, okay? An examination of the original Hebrew will dispel any illusion that morning star is an acceptable substitute for the word Lucifer. The Hebrew is Halel ben um, Shakbar, I, I'm, I'm sure I'm butchering that, okay, which is accurately translated Lucifer, son of the morning. The NIV and New American Standard Bible give an English translation as if the Hebrew were, I'm not even going to pronounce it, but it's obviously different, or morning star, son of the dawn. Yet the word for star appears nowhere in the text. Also, morning appears only once, as the King James Version shows, not twice, as new, as new versions indicate. The word, for stars, the word for stars, translated as star dozens of other times by the NIV translators, morning or dawn is likewise used hundreds of times new version editors know that that he, those hebrew words that no new version editors know the hebrew words in question is morning star since it is used in job 38 7 if god intended to communicate morning star he would have repeated it here the word he chose halal appears nowhere else in the old testament just as lucifer appears nowhere else the ultimate blasphemy occurs when the morning star takes Lucifer's place in Isaiah 14. Jesus Christ is the morning star as identified as such in Revelation 22, 16, chapter 2, verse 28, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19. With this sleight of hand switch, Satan not only slyly slips out of the picture, but lives up to his name, the accuser, Revelation 12, 10, by attempting to make Jesus Christ the subject of the diatribe in Isaiah 14. Now, what is she arguing there? She's arguing that when the new versions say morning star or day star, they are attempting, as part of a new age conspiracy, to switch the identity of Satan as Lucifer with who? Christ. With Jesus Christ. That is the assertion Gail Ripplinger is making, and that is the underpinning of everything she's going to argue now in New Age Bible versions, which is her inaugural book from 1993. This is the first book she wrote in 1993. She was wholly unknown to anybody in the King James only world until she wrote this book in 1993. Okay? Now, the marginal note. So let's just go back up and look at it. Now let's say Gail Ripplinger is right for the sake of argument. What's the problem with the 1611? What do the King James translators do in the margin? Do they give as an alternative to Lucifer? So she never, did you have any time in any of that hear her mention this marginal note? No. no. It's completely left out of the conversation. Whether she checked it and knew about it or whatever, it, it, she's completely silent on the whole thing. Now, how many of you think that's a problem? Yeah. I think it's a problem. Let's go underneath that bottom of page three. The marginal note in Isaiah 14, 12 and the 16, 11 is a major blow to standard King James only talking points. Why was this marginal note never addressed by Ripplinger? The King James translators viewed Daystar 
as an English definition for the Latin word Lucifer in the main body of the text. How do I know? Do they do that? Mm -hmm. What do they say? They say Lucifer or what? Daystar. Daystar. She never mentions this. Okay? Let's keep going in the notes. Is that really a proper name or is that just a description of a Which one? Oh, Daystar. So, I mean, we'll get to the... A, a good person as, as opposed to a, 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 some bad person? I mean, could it, could it be referred to both of those people? So we will, I, I will jump ahead and, and answer your question, but we'll talk about it in more detail at the end. Okay. Lucifer to me is the proper name. Right. Yeah. This is the meaning of the name. Exactly. Okay. But is that just an adjective or is that really the name? It's, oh, it's related to the name. And I'm going to show you conclusively that going all the way back to the 1400s, there were people who were identifying or defining the English, the word Lucifer as Daystar. Okay. But in, in that earlier thing, it said Lucifer is only mentioned one time? Lucifer is only mentioned one time in the entire Bible, in Isaiah 14. Okay. okay. So let's go back to the notes. This textual fact constitutes an inconvenient truth for many King James advocates. I have never heard anyone talk about this topic and was not aware of this marginal note until studying to prepare these lessons. So how, so how do we make sense of what is going on here? Does Ripplinger's theological charge leveled against the New Version editors apply equally to the King James Version translators for their suggested alternative reading or Daystar? Are they suggesting in the margin what the other ones have in the text? And yet she never mentions it. And she accuses them here of being involved in a New Age conspiracy to switch the identity of, of Satan with who? Jesus Christ, and she never mentions the marginal note, which is plainly in the text at Isaiah 14, 12. Okay? So maybe the King James translators knew something Gail Ripplinger didn't. Imagine that. Okay? Now look, guys, I'm serious. What I'm teaching you right now is going to get me in hot water. There are going to be people that are madder and stool pigeons because I'm going over this information. And to that I would just say, don't be mad at me for telling you the truth. Be mad at Gail Ripplinger for misrepresenting the truth. Okay? So, pre-English marginalia, pre-1611 marginalia. So now we need to look at some, some evidences here. Okay? Now I'm going to show these pictures and then I'm going to go back to, the, back to where I was as far as what I'm displaying online. So, pre-1611 marginalia. Let's read that last question again on the bottom of page 3. Okay? Does... does does Ripplinger's theological charge leveled against New Age, ver, New Age version editors equally apply to the King James translators based upon their suggested alternative reading or Daystar? So we need to look at more evidence. The first category of evidence I want to look at with you is English pre-1611 marginalia. Now, some pre-1611 English Bibles, Matthews and Geneva specifically, also included a marginal note at Isaiah 14.12 connecting Lucifer with Morning Star. Were these English reformers guilty of the same theology as the, quote, new version editors as Gail Ripplinger has asserted? So understand, if she's going to make that assertion, she's going to have to apply it now to everybody who makes this connection between Lucifer and what? Morning star slash day star. Okay? Now here is the note. This is the 1537 Matthew's Bible. Here is the main body of the text. Notice the verse here. This is before they put verse numbering in. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, thou fair morning child? Okay? And then notice right here, you have a marginal note now appended to the word Lucifer. In the margin here at this verse. Does everybody see that? Yes? Yeah. It's a pretty long marginal note. Let's go to the next page. <clears throat> The main text of the Matthew Bible reads, quote, How art thou fallen from heaven, though fair morning child? At Isaiah 14, 12, with the following note appended to the margin. Now here's a quote of the marginal note. He compareth the death of Nebuchadnezzar to the falling of Lucifer, the morning star. So are they calling Lucifer there the morning star? Yeah. Okay, Rogers is doing that. 
to the falling of Lucifer, the morning star, which he calleth the child of the morning, because it appeareth only in the morning. So they're talking about a star that appears when? In the morning before the sun comes up is my understanding, right? The meaning is, no such thing ought to have happened unto thee, that in earth was like the morning star, which no man can take out of heaven. And thou that was so mighty, that destroyest what people thou wouldest, and unto whom it was a pastime to overthrow nations, hast received such measure as thou broughtest, such a like thing is there in Ezekiel 28 against King Cyrus. Okay, so is it talking about a star that ought not to have fallen, but has fallen? And are they connecting Lucifer in that marginal note with Morning Star? Okay. Do you think Gail Ripplinger ever talked about this? Shake your head no. She did not. Okay. So, look at the next point. So, John Rogers, the translator of the Matthews Bible and friend of William Tyndall, connected Lucifer with Morning Star in Isaiah 14. Moreover, Rogers connected Isaiah 14 with Ezekiel 28. So are we to conclude, therefore, based upon the argumentation of Gail Ripplinger, that John Rogers, friend of William Tyndall, was also a New Age conspirator when he connected Lucifer with Morningstar in the marginal note of his Bible? You see where this goes if that's the argument you want to stick with. Okay? 1560 Geneva Bible. Okay, here's the verse. So now you'll notice we have numbering now. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? Notice there's a right here, H, C, H, on Lucifer. Notice there's a marginal note now for this in the Geneva Bible. So let's look at this. So under the image. So the main body, so the main text, excuse me. If the Geneva Bible reads, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? The following marginal note is appended to the word Lucifer. It says, quote, Thou that thought thyself most glorious, as it were placed in heaven for the what? Morning star that goes before the sun is called Lucifer to whom Nebuchadnezzar is compared. So are they connecting Lucifer with the morning star? In their marginal note. Is everybody following this? So go to page 6. So were the Geneva Bible translators guilty of a new age plot to obscure the identity of Satan in their marginal note when they connected Lucifer with morning star? No. No. That's absurd. Mm -hmm. That is totally on its face absurd. So, Gail Ripplinger never told you about the marginal note in the 1611. She never told you about the explanatory note in the, in the Matthews Bible, a Bible which she believes is in the, in, the, in the correct stream of Bibles, or the 1560 Geneva Bible. She never says how any of those prior six pre-1611 English Bibles connect Lucifer to Morningstar in their explanatory marginal notes. Are you following this? Okay? So, two pre-1611 Reformation era English Bibles clearly connect Lucifer with Morningstar in their marginal exposition of the passage. Why would this be the case? Could there have been a historic lexicographical connection in English between Lucifer and Morningstar slash Daysar that Gail Ripplinger was not aware of? Maybe the problem is with Gail Ripplinger and her understanding of what's going on. Okay, now look, I'm just going to be honest. I do not trust Gail Ripplinger. She has, I have caught her in too many false statements, manufactured citations, things that are completely wrong on their face. And I don't think anybody should use the arguments of Gail Ripplinger in their defense of the King James Bible. Just saying. Now, some people are going to not like me for saying that, but that's what I believe. And if you're going to try to persuade me based on an argument by Gail Ripplinger, you better bring your receipts that prove that Gail Ripplinger is telling the truth. Okay, I'm providing you with receipts right now. 
I'm showing you the marginal note of the 1611. I'm showing you pre-1611 uh, English uh, Bibles and how they handle the issue in their marginalia. And now we're going to look at lexicographical evidence for this. Okay. So according to the Oxford English Dictionary, the word Lucifer came into English usage as a reference to Satan before his rebellion via the Latin Vulgate. Please consider the following entry. So here is the entry. Okay. One meaning 1 2 a the so this is the entry for lucifer the rebel archangel who fell from heaven was supposed uh, was was supposed to be referred to in isaiah 14:12 satan the devil now rare and serious use current chiefly in the phrase as proud as lucifer now look at what they say under that the scripture passage from the Vulgate, which is Latin, okay? King James, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, is part of a parable against the king of Babylon, Isaiah 14, 4. But the mention of a fall from heaven led Christian interpreters to suppose that the king of Babylon was to be interpreted spiritually as a designation of the chief of the angels who kept not their first estate, Hence the general patristic view that Lucifer was the name of Satan before his fall. Now watch. The Latin word was adopted in all English versions down to 1611. So all the English versions, when it came to translating this, this Hebrew word, they all translate it using what word? Lucifer. And the word Lucifer is coming into English through what language? Latin. Are you following that? Okay. Okay. Look at the Middle English Dictionary. Meanwhile, the Middle English Dictionary contains an entry for Lucifer, the following entry for Lucifer. So here we have Lucifer, all right? Look at number one, A, the leader of the fallen angels, the devil. So is it clearly defining Lucifer as the leader of the fallen angels? Mm -hmm. All right? Then notice there's an example given here. From 1340, this is Middle English, I can't read all this, but I can make out whose name? Lucifer. Lucifer. So is Lucifer being used in Middle English as early as 1340 as a reference to the devil? Yeah. According to the Middle English Dictionary. What's the answer? Yes. Mm -hmm. Go to page 7. Okay. Use of Lucifer in English as a reference to Satan dates to at least 1340 according to the Middle English Dictionary. Additional lexicographical information is very instructive to this investigation. Once again, we will turn to the lexicons of early modern English for assistance. And guys, again, that's this website right here. The Lexicons of Modern, modern Early English provided by the uh, University of Toronto. If you click on the word search, Go to Quicks, Quick Search. We'll type in Lucifer. And you will see that we get a ton of data here about meaning. And notice this is between 1450 and when? 1800. Notice that we get a ton of data going all the way back to 1480. Lexicographical information of the word, word Lucifer being connected to what word? It says day star, which is the word they have where? In the margin of the 1611. Okay, so let's go through this, okay? Now, some of these are going to be, so what you have in your notes, guys, is a reproduction of most of this material that we get when we go to the lexicons of early modern English. So circa 1480, the author here is anonymous, but notice Lucifer, there's an entry for Lucifer, and it is, the word Lucifer is defined as what? The day star. Is that exactly what is in the margin of the 1611? Yes. For Lucifer. Look at 1483. Okay. There's an entry for day star. And it's defined as what? Lucifer. Lucifer. Go to 1499. Notice 1499. Morning star defined as what? Lucifer. Go to 1538. So all these are predating the 1611. Go to 1538. Lucifer is defined as what? 
day star, okay? Go to uh, 1542, Biblioteca, okay? Again, Lucifer is defined as meaning what? Day star. Day star. Go to 15, uh, we're on 1552, right? Okay, English, English Latin alphabet here is what this is. Notice day star is defined as what? Lucifer. Lucifer. Notice there's a second entry, star called the day star, also defined as what? So do we have tons of lexicographical information going predating the 1611 that are connecting Lucifer with day star and morning star? Yep. Okay. 1587, a dictionary of Latin and English languages by Thomas Thomas. Notice, notice this entry here. Okay, this is uh, all in Latin. But the day star, also called who? Lucifer. Lucifer. So uh, look at 1656, Glossopedia or a dictionary, Thomas Blanc. Lucifer, the day star, but figuratively the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, and arch devil. So do we have lexicographical information going all the way back to nearly 200 years before the King James Bible that are connecting the word English word Lucifer with both day star and morning star in their definitions? Yes. Is everybody following? Yes. Okay. So we got 1658, the bottom of page 7, New World, uh, uh, New World of English Words by Edward Phillips, connects Lucifer as it were, light bearing to morning star, called in Greek. So there's another connection. 1677, an English dictionary by Elijah Coles. Lucifer, the morning star, also related to uh, the archdevil or Satan. And then 1735, a new English dictionary, okay, is defining Lucifer as the morning one. Star. So I would say. There's ample lexicographical ev evidence in English for Lucifer being defined as morning star or what? Day star predating the King James Bible by nearly 200 years. Okay? Is she still alive or has she ever been asked that? <laughs> um, I don't know. I've never heard anybody talk about what I'm talking about in this lesson. I, 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 so... My sense is maybe not, okay? So, Lucifer, look at the next point. Lucifer is a Latin word meaning light bearer or light bearing. And it came into English through the influence of Latin. Consider the following comparison between the Latin Vulgate and Wycliffe's translation of Isaiah 14:12 uh, in the 1380s. Wycliffe is not translating Hebrew, he's translating the Latin Vulgate when he does his translation in the 1380s, okay? But notice, so he's translating a text that says Lucifer in Latin. When he goes to put that into English, he just simply transliterates the word, lifts it out of the Latin, and puts it where? Into English, as that's, that's exactly what he did. That's where the word came from. That's how the word got into the English lexicon as a reference to Satan is because of the influence of the Latin Vulgate on the English language. Is everybody following that? Look at the next point. Wycliffe simply moved the word slash name Lucifer forward into Middle English out of Latin. This convention stuck as Coverdale, Matthews, Great, Geneva, Bishops and Reims Bibles all followed suit in using Lucifer as the translation of the Hebrew word Halel in Isaiah 14. So they all just follow that precedent and refer to the person here that's being discussed in Isaiah 14 as who in English? Lucifer. Prior to that it was Halel. That's the Hebrew. But that's how they translated it in Bible. That is how Jerome translated the Hebrew into Latin, he translated it as Lucifer. Then the Latin influences English. Wycliffe, when he translates the verse out of the Latin Vulgate, he just simply transfers the name out of Latin and puts it where? Into Middle English. Okay, now go back to your notes. Recall from above, so let me just scroll back to that so I can show you what I'm talking about. Right here, okay. Recall from above 
that the Middle English Dictionary cataloged a usage of Lucifer from 1340, right here, 1340. Okay, we already looked at it, 1340, Lucifer, A, the leader of the fallen angels, the devil. Okay, back to the, the, the note, or the point. Recall from above that the Middle English Dictionary cataloged a usage of Lucifer from, thir from 1340, nearly four decades before Wycliffe translated his Bible. Meanwhile, lexicographical evidence exists from the 15th century that the meaning of Lucifer was tied to both day star and morning star. I showed you that many times over already. Therefore, when the King James translators offered day star in the margin at Isaiah 14, 12 as an alternative to Lucifer, they were using an English synonym of long established meaning. One could argue, as is often the case in the marginal notes found in the 1611, that Daystar is a more literal English rendering of the Hebrew word Hillel directly into English. Because Lucifer is coming out of what language? Latin. Latin. Okay? Is everybody following this so far? Mm -hmm. Now, I'll just say, did, did, did Gail Ripplinger talk about any of this? No. She did not. She did not, and then does she make a pretty pernicious accusation against people based upon an inadequate sampling of information. Now, I'm not saying I agree with all the decisions made by modern version editors, because you know that I don't. But I'm saying to call these guys guilty of a New Age conspiracy and to leave all this information out of the explanation, to me, is a major problem. Okay? So there's one other category I want to look at, and this is other Reformation era vernacular translations. The same phenomenon can be observed when one looks at other Protestant era vernacular language translations of the 16th and 17th centuries. So go to page 9. So here we have Luther's German from 1535. Obviously you can't read German but we will, I've translated it for you using tools, okay? So here's Luther's German. Luther's German text reads, quote, this is an English translation of the German. How you fell from heaven, you beautiful morning star. How art thou fallen to earth who weakened the heathen? So I mean, clearly Martin Luther, when he calls the person here, a morning star, is clearly engaged in a New Age conspiracy to swap the identity of uh, Lucifer or Satan with Jesus Christ, right? I mean, clearly that's what Luther's doing. No. All he's trying to do is translate out of Hebrew into what? German. Okay? But if Ripplinger's going to be consistent, does she have to accuse Luther of the same thing? Look at the 1562 Italian, okay? Now this is interesting. Here's the verse, verse 12. And no, I know it's a little bit blurry, but notice, is there a marginal note here on the portion of the verse in question? So let's look at, so the main body of the 1562 Italian text reads, O morning star, daughter of the dawn. Whereas the marginal note reads, Or Lucifer, son of the dawn. So is the Italian doing it exactly the opposite of what the 1611 did? The 1611 is giving you, what is, what are the, uh, sorry, the Italian is giving you O morning star in the text and giving you Lucifer where? In the, in the margin, which is exactly the opposite of what the 1611 did. The 1611 gave you Lucifer in the text and or day star where? In the, in the margin, okay? Look at the 1569 Spanish. In Spanish, the main body of the text reads, O Lucifer, son of the morning. Whereas the margin reads, or son, that is, illustrious prince. So notice, here's the Spanish. Can you clearly make out the word Lucifer in Spanish right here? Yeah. So it has Lucifer in the text. There's a marginal note here. It tells you to go uh, to the margin where it gives, uh, or son, that is, illustrious prince, as the text. So is it doing it similarly to what the previous one we looked at did? Just, it's flipped. Okay? Go to page 10. Here we have a Reformation era French Bible. 1588. 
Okay, this this uh, clause here in question, starting here, I'm not going to pronounce, try to pronounce the French, but that clause right there, okay, the French means morning what? Star. Look at the 1602 Spanish. The 1602 Spanish, notice, has what? Uh, am I in the right spot? Yeah. yeah. It's got Lucifer in the text, and then it's got a marginal note appended to it again. Yeah. Okay? So in the Spanish, the main body of the text reads, O Lucifer, son of the morning, whereas the margin reads, or son, that is, illustrious prince. So they're clearly engaging in a New Age conspiracy as well, right? Yeah. 1607, Italy, or say the Italian, by Diodati. Yeah. Okay. So my 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 friend, my uh, I think Italian. My, my Italian missionary friend, I think he's going to be happy with me now. <laughs> okay. So the 1607 Diodati moved the marginal reading from the previous one from 1562 Italian into the main body of the text. O Lucifer, child of the dawn. His footnote reads, How are you fallen from heaven, your sovereign height and, and dignity, you who were like the morning star in splendor and glory? Okay? So what I want you to see here is this. Let's go back to the previous Italian one. Okay? Notice that they had morning star and they had Lucifer where? In the margin. Let's go now to the 1607. And notice that the situation is flipped. Notice that now they have Lucifer where? In the text. And they have Morning Star, even though it's cut off in this picture. There's Morning Star where? In the margin. Okay? And then we have the 1637 Dutch Stadafatalum. Which I hope I'm saying that right. The 1637 Dutch reads... How art thou fallen from heaven, O morning star? Thou son of the dawn, how art thou cut down to the ground? Uh, thou, hast, thou hast offended the heathen, is the way that reads. Okay. Notice that you have a number 43 here before O morning star. You see that? Yeah. If you scroll down, you'll see here in the, here's note 43. So this note 43 goes with the 43 that was in the verse. Okay? So here's a screenshot of the margin of marginal note 43 appended to Isaiah 14:12 in the Stata Fatalum. Trans, translated, note 43 reads, quote, So the prophet called the king of Babel because his glory here on earth was as the luster of the brightness of the morning star in heaven or in the firmament shining clearer and brighter than any of the other stars in heaven, insomuch that it alone giveth a shadow. Okay, so clearly, are they, are they, are they giving explanation there on Morningstar why they decided in Dutch to translate it what? Morningstar. So, here's the question then. Were all the Reformation era translators responsible for the Bibles listed above part of a New Age New Age plot to obscure the identity of Satan? No. I don't think so. Mm -hmm. Or were they just trying to render the Reformation era text in their mother tongues as accurately as possible? Yep. If Gail Ripplinger is going to condemn modern version editors, is she willing to do the same thing for these Reformation era translators as well? Including who, by the way? The sixteen eleven translators, because they do the same thing as all these other ones were doing. Okay, and by the way, have we already seen that they're looking at these other sources? Are they looking at the Dutch and the French and the Spanish and the German? Are they looking at all this stuff? Maybe not the Dutch because it was done later. But they're looking at the Spanish and the Italian, and they're looking at all of this stuff. And are they seeing these guys doing the same thing? Do they have massive amounts of less lexicographical evidence in their own language of Lucifer being defined as day star or morning star? Yes. Okay. So conclusion, page 11. Before one dismisses the lexicographical and translational evidence presented in this lesson on the grounds, 
that Satan cannot possibly be referred to as, quote, the day star slash morning star because it is a reference to Jesus Christ, they need to consider Job 38, 7. Job 38, 7 says, When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Now, don't read my note. Who is that referring to? Who is Job 38, 7 referring to? When it says, oh, When all the morning stars sang together and the sons of God shouted for joy. I think it's referring to angels. Okay? And it refers to them as morning what? Stars. So, if one of the morning stars fell from heaven, would that be a problem? No. Okay, look at the next point. Does that refer to all angels or like the archangels? I think it refers to the angelic all order, host. Yeah. Because they were all present when God created. Okay? At least, it, it, it refers to at least the... It seems to be a hierarchy. Right, there's clearly an angelic hierarchy. I don't dispute that. It could be also referring to the angels that were still on God's side. Yeah, um, exactly. But Lucifer was clearly a cherub, according to Ezekiel 28. Thou art the anointed cherub that covered, I have set thee so. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire, yada, yada, yada. Ezekiel 28, right? Okay. So, most interpreters understand... The morning stars of Job 38 7 to be a reference to angels. So, as the former anointed cherub that covered the throne of God, Ezekiel 28 11 through 19, was not Satan numbered among the morning stars before his fall? Therefore, Satan was a day star slash morning star that fell from heaven, exactly as stated in Isaiah 14. Did he used to have an exalted position as the anointed cherub that covered the throne of God? He's lifted up by his pride, and because of his pride he's lifted up, and is he cast forth out of the third heaven? Okay? So did he fall from heaven? And Isaiah 14 is a, is a proverb. When you read that in Isaiah 14, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? Okay? How, uh, the, the, the weakest the nations... Uh, and it, it, then it recounts how he has said in his heart, I will, you know, ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will sit in the mount of the congregation on the sides of the north. I will be like the most high is that, that, that fifth I will statement there that he makes, right? So that's a proverb that's going to be recited to the guy as he's in the future at the time of the, at the time of the millennium when he's cast into the lake of fire, into the pit for a thousand years. Okay. So most interpreters understand the morning stars of Job 38, 7 to be a reference to angels. So as a former anointed cherub that covered the throne of God, Ezekiel 28, 11 through 19, was not Satan numbered among the morning stars before his fall. Therefore, Satan was a day star slash morning star that fell from heaven, exactly as stated in Isaiah 14, 12. As noted above, the Hebrew word halal only occurs one time in the biblical text. Textual occurrences like the one in Isaiah 14, 12 are precisely the type of situation that Miles Smith stated in the preface that the translators elected to use marginal notes. Look at the quote, top page 12. And I'm scrolling back there because I want to park that there. They said, Miles Smith said, there be many words in Scripture which be never found but what? Once. Once. Having neither brother nor neighbor as the Hebrews speak, so that we cannot be holpen, that means helped, by conference of places. No, uh, now in such a case doth a margin do well to admonish the reader to seek further and not to conclude or dogmatize upon this or that um, preemptorily. So does this fit the classification of where they would be keen to use a marginal note in a word that only occurs one time in the text? Yes. Okay. In addition, the marginal notes in the 1611, in addition, marginal notes in the 1611 occur quite frequently when proper names, that'd be Lucifer, are found in the text. In these cases, the margin is used to provide the meaning of the proper name in question Please consider but a few examples. Now, some of these names I'm not even going to try to pronounce because I'm going to butcher them all. But you'll notice Genesis 16, 14. I'm on page 12. There's a name given, and then notice what it says. That is the well of him that liveth and seeth me. So it's, the, it's saying what the name one means. Look at Isaiah 8, 1. Another massive name I'm not even going to try to pronounce. 
Notice, Hebrew, in making seed to spoil, he hasteneth, pray, or make speed. So are they telling you what that name means? Yep. Okay, Jeremiah 29, 24. There's another name I'm not even going to pronounce, and it defines it as a what? Dreamer. Dreamer. In, in Jeremiah 36, 26, there's another name I'm not going to pronounce, and it says, or of the king. I believe I believe the dagger is, uh, is an error there. It should have been a double vertical line. But it's defining the word. Jeremiah 43, 13, uh, Beshemish, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Or the house of the sun. So notice that in many cases, the text is giving you the proper name. And the margin is telling you what the name what? Means. Do you see that? Yeah. So what is the house of the sun? That, that seems more than so those are included Bart just as other examples okay so when this one says Lucifer I believe Lucifer is the proper name or Daystar is a definition of what Lucifer, Lucifer. does that make perfect sense Given all the lexicographical information I showed you, going all the way back to the 1480s of Lucifer being referred to or defined as Daystar in contemporary sources of that time period. Okay, so let's go underneath here. The marginal note found in Isaiah 14 12 in the 1611 seems to fit both criteria. First, it occurs at a place where the Hebrew word in question, Hillel, appears nowhere else in the biblical text. So does it meet the criteria of a word that cannot be helped, where there is no help to be provided by conference of other places? Because it only occurs how many times? One time. So it meets that criteria. Second, it occurs in a place where the translators seem to be elaborating on the meaning of the proper name Lucifer. The King James translators were not so theologically sloppy to confuse Satan for Jesus when they inserted the marginal note or day star into the AV at Isaiah 14, 12. They were simply using an English synonym of long established meaning. They are defining what, what the proper name Lucifer means. It means what? Day star. Day star. That's it. So now this, is, this example fits the criteria of what seems to be their practice and their stated perp, their stated uh, um, situations in which they were going to use marginal notes and words that only occur one time for which they cannot offer any conference of places. Is everybody following this? Yes. Okay. There's an interesting article on the KJV Today website, Lucifer or Daystar in Isaiah 14.12, that attempts to address the marginal note appended to Isaiah 14.12 in the 1611. The unidentified author of the article appears to be attempting to lay out a middle-of-the-road position between the one enunciated by Gail Ripplinger and the one being asserted in this lesson. Okay, They say, quote, Isaiah 14, 12 uses celestial imagery to illustrate the fall of Halel. In this picture, Halel is compared with the planet Venus, which appears early in the morning. Thus, Daystar is the symbolic referent in Isaiah 14, 12, and the King James Version margin indicates. So are they at least acknowledging what it says on the margin? Okay. That being said, Halel is much more than just the planet Venus. Planet Venus is an inanimate object, but Isaiah 14, 12 through 14 clearly describes a morally evil being with anti-God ambitions. Clearly, I agree with that. Although planet Venus, the day star, is, inten is intended in the symbolism, the word Halel itself does not consist of the Hebrew words for day and star. Thus, day star is not the most accurate translation. Furthermore, unnecessarily having day star in Isaiah 14, 12 can cause confusion uh, because there's, uh, there's another different day star in 2 Peter uh, 1, 19. Uh, the day star in Isaiah 14, 12 is not the day star of 2 Peter uh, 1, 19. The day star in 2 Peter 1, 19 is the son of righteousness, Malachi 4, 2, who is Jesus Christ. Um, skipping the parentheses for the sake of time, the day star in Isaiah 14, 12 is Venus, 
which represents Satan. The sun represents Jesus Christ, the king of Israel, whereas Venus represents Satan, the king of Babylon. Having Lucifer, Venus, instead of Daystar in Isaiah 14 distinguishes the celestial body in Isaiah 14, 12 from that in 2 Peter 1, 19. So they're trying there to say that it has to say Lucifer, and if it said Daystar, it would cause a confusion because of the other cross-references that use what? Day star. So they're, they're, the, the King James Version Today website is trying to sort of walk a line, I think, between what Ripplinger said and kind of what I'm suggesting in this lesson. Okay? But do they at least acknowledge the marginal note? Yes. Yes. Okay? So, the additional Reformation era vernacular translation surveyed in this lesson seems to suggest that translating the Hebrew word Hillel in Isaiah 14 possesses a unique challenge in many languages. When one combines the translational and lexicographical evidence regarding the historical connection between Lucifer and Daystar in the English language, a revised understanding emerges. The King James translators used Satan's proper pre-fall name Lucifer in the body of the text while providing a definition daystar in the margin like they did with many other similar situations. When one drops verbatim identicality of wording as the standard for preservation and acknowledge there are different ways of saying the same thing, they are free to follow the evidence where it leads. Why was none of this evidence presented in this lesson ever presented by Gail Ripplinger? Okay. I'm calling, ah, yes, I am. I'm calling it out. You should not, on the face, trust anything that's said here without verifying it. So, anybody have any comments or questions? So, Mike, what do you think? You think I'm in left field? I think, no, I think it's great. I think it's yeah. Right on. And let me tell you, I myself am guilty of repeating this. There are messages on the church website where you will hear me repeating this. The question I have is, do I take those messages down? Or do I leave them there as a testimony to what I taught previous? I don't want to mislead people in the present, but I also need to have documentation that I have changed my mind. And the reason I've changed my mind is the translators have compelled me that I have to think different. Because the way I was thinking about it did not even mention this. Okay? I think I would leave them and just put it in order. Uh, do what uh, the old uh, classic television shows do when they show the gun smoke and those things. <laughs> These shows were made in a different time period and smoking was allowed. And it's, a, <laughs> it's a terrible thing. Uh -huh. Be careful you're not offended. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think I'm going to leave them. But look, guys, you got to understand. Like I, I, I'm sort of got a little bit of fear and trepidation to look at what happens with this. But if this blows up this week on the internet, you're going to know why. Because I'm calling this out as this this is this is garbage reasoning. I'm sorry. It's 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 not good. And it is indicative of a host of error. This is the inaugural book. And at, its, at the face is a massive, massive problem that is going to now cause... I'm not saying everything in the book is totally wrong. But what I'm saying is that the fundamental premise of the book is incorrect and doesn't even touch on extremely important, relevant data that would then castigate other people of the Reformation era who seem to have a same, you know, who seem to be wrestling with the same understanding of what they should do here, not only in English, but across all the languages of the Protestant Reformation, then there's got to be a problem with that view. Okay? So, if I'm shish kebab skewered and burned at the stake between now and next week, you'll know why. Okay, yes, thank you so much. <laughs> All right, we, we got to quit. We're past time. Um, but I do think this is a better, more sound explanation of what's going on here than what is enunciated by Gail Ripplinger in New Age Bible versions.